Welcome, everyone. Um, I think we're going to take a, a start um, the presentation. Um, I want to welcome you all to today's talk. Um, my name is Shannon Supple, and I'm the curator of rare books at Smith College in Massachusetts. Um, I first want to start by noting that um, online conferences mean we all stand on different land as we join in community. I stand on Nanatuck and Pecumtuck land. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge our neighboring indigenous nations, the Nipmuc and the Wapanoag to the east, the Mohegan and Pequot to the south, the Mohican to the west, and the Abenaki to the north. Logistics. Um, after this introduction, our speaker will begin and we will have a Q&A session following. We are recording the talk and the Q&A and the chat will be disabled for the talk portion and we will open it for the Q&A section of the presentation. Um, we'd encourage you to add your questions into the Zoom's Q&A function. And you're also able to um, sort of thumbs up icon and, and upvote um, a question that someone else has asked so we can identify what questions are most compelling to our attendees and make sure that those get answered. Um, I want to especially encourage students to ask questions. Um, and we want to hear from you, and we want to hear from all of you. So lifelong learners, please ask questions as well. Um, I want to make sure that I thank everyone who's here today for this talk. Um, I really appreciate you being here and joining us in this conversation. I also want to thank my Smith College Library colleagues, Nicole Calero, Jess Blasco, and Allison Bates and the information technologies colleagues, Maria Douglas and Sanford Pluitt for help in making today's program possible. Um, this is um, the Enid Mark Lecture Series and the annual Enid Mark Lecture on Poetry and Contemporary Book Arts was created in honor of artist, writer, and publisher Enid Mark, Smith College Class of 1954. Enid Mark studied English literature and studio art at Smith College. She pursued painting and printmaking in her early years and then went to photolithography later on. In 1986, she founded Elm Press and was passionate about words and imagery. From the 1980s until shortly before her death in 2008, Enid focused on every aspect of her books, the text, the imagery, which often included her own artwork, her type design and layout and binding. In creating her books, she collaborated with a stalwart group of New England artists. And Smith College Special Collections is lucky to steward many of Enid's books. We are grateful to Enid and to her family, including her late husband, Jean, and her son, Peter, for envisioning and enabling this lecture series. So we're here today for the 2021 Enid Mark Lecture, Queer Pasts, Nourish Queer Futures, featuring Brooke Silva, Sylvia Palmieri. Brooke is a writer, printer, and bookseller, and I say creative force in the universe. They completed a PhD in history at University College London in 2017 with their dissertation, Compelling Reading, the Circulation of Quaker Texts from 1650 to 1700. Brooke founded Camp Books in 2018, a traveling bookshop and publishing imprint focusing on LGBTQIA history and its allied social movements. Since 2015, Brooke has edited Printing History, the Journal of the American Printing Association, History Association, and is a member of the faculty at London Rare Book School teaching the queer book since 2016. Brooke is also a studio member at the London Center for Book Arts, where Camp Books Printed Matter is created. And you can learn more about Brooke and their work at their website, which is campbooks.biz. And I will add that into the Q&A or into the chat momentarily. So um, I met Brooke about seven years ago. From the very first, I found Brooke to be a generous scholar and human. Brooke has a way of putting you at ease and finding joy in who you are. They're passionate about their work and still share their curiosity and knowledge in a way that gives space for others too. Brooke crosses boundaries. 
stretching cords of concepts and community across canyons. They find connections others might not think to notice. They weave time, geographies, and perspectives into an irresistible intertwingularity. Today, Brooke will speak to us about the queerness of printed media as it dates back to the early modern period, joining the distant past with the more recent 20th and 21st century explosion in media related to LGBTQIA liberation movements. Please join me in welcoming Brooke Sylvia Palmieri. Hello, hello everyone. Um, it's, it's really lovely to be here. Thank you so much, Shannon. It's um, also really nice to be reminded how long we've been friends uh, and I have always cherished your friendship. So thank you for your work in bringing me to uh, you all tonight via, via satellite, uh, live via satellite. Um, and thank you to the staff um, at Special Collections Library at Smith. Um, I mean, I, I, I can't, I, I have to start just by uh, reflecting a little bit on how difficult it is to give a talk um, at a time when people are dying around us. And I find, um, you know, it, I, I guess I have to speak rather than be silent and <clears throat> say that uh, it's, it's really difficult to speak about something that is so luxurious as the distant past um, when uh, Dante Wright is dead, when Dominique Luscious is dead, uh, when Jada Peterson is dead, um, just to say the names of a few black people, two of them black trans women who have been murdered in the past 10 days. Um, I guess the reason I'm saying their names in this specific context is because it's just a fact of chronology that queer consciousness and queer liberation movements, the ones that I'm talking about and will be evoking today, really owe everything to the work of black intellectuals and activists and specifically black queer and trans people. Um, the shape of our archives, the, the work I do is very much influenced by that struggle and remains politicized by that struggle. And so there's no way I can get outside of that. Um, my talk doesn't exist outside of a culture of violence and oppression that begins with white supremacy. Um, and even if it feels like I'm speaking of things a little bit distant from that tonight, there's still huge implications for how gender is shaped and policed that come from white supremacy. Um, and that makes it really difficult to know how to use the next 50 or so minutes. But um, I feel like I can still stick with the title of my talk because um, the action of that talk is about, is about nourishment. And that's etymologically about feeding uh, sustenance. So the focus that I wanna use the space for and the space of the more distant past tonight um, is to just give us some time for rest, for safe reflection, um, for thinking about how to build solidarity and what work that might entail. And I do that mindful that the current environment that we live in doesn't really um, offer those things or make those things easily accessible, that safety and that space. So I think I, what I'd like to do um, is to try to use the heft of the past as it survives in the form of books and prints to sort of balance out what's happening in the present. And I'm, a, I'm aware you can use the heft of the past to do just the opposite, it's all too easy. But um, yeah, I'm grateful for all of you tuning in here tonight. Um, I hope that you're keeping safe um, and I hope that our time together gives you some time to rest. And from that, I'm, I'm still following black leadership um, as Audre Lorde teaches us that caring for ourselves is not self-indulgence, it's self-preservation and that's an act of political warfare. Uh, so I'm gonna go with that. Um, and let me just enter this slideshow and let's get started. So I, I say that before talking about my work with old books and papers and posters, uh, the stuff of history making, because I believe that we're at a point where literally everything needs to change. And I'm not exaggerating. No matter how remote it may feel, all the stuff that we have, all the buildings filled with paper and clouds holding pixels, all the ways that we assemble that stuff and all of the meanings and uh, values that we extract from it have to change. And I think luckily some instruction survives scattered among those documents that gives us tips about the changes that need to take place. Um, so, I'm, and I'm, I'm echoing there what Fred Moten and Stefano Harney say in the undercommons that it's up to us to talk about what's worth keeping and carrying forward and what needs to be left behind. 
And Walter Benjamin puts it this way in his arcades project. He says, we construct an alarm clock that rouses the kitsch of the previous assembly of the previous century to political assembly. And when I first read that as like a 20 year old, I immediately found a helpful description of what I wanted to do. Yes, it's a little bit kitsch, but yes, it can be ranged in certain alarmingly political ways. So that's a little bit of what I'm trying to do here. Um, and to create a sense of shared mentality, I just, I think it's worth saying that this talk is part of my overall work as a historian who sells rare and secondhand books and archive materials on the one hand and fills some of the gaps in their histories with printing and publishing on the other. Um, I salvage queer books and place them like ticking time bombs in special collections libraries with the hope that one day they will blow someone's mind in a good way, like a student's or a librarian's or an archivist's. Um, or alternately, someone buys a secondhand stuff from me as a gift to give to their lover or their friend, and they get charged with one form of erotic energy or another, and they continue along a queer provenance, which gives me incredible pleasure. Um, or maybe it's more accurate to say that I scatter these items as in the parable of the mustard seeds, and I don't know which will grow or which will be choked by thorns, but I have to give these items a chance of survival across different environments, and I have to hope that something will take. The money I make through these secondhand materials and recycled papers helps me stay alive because I don't have any other source of income and it gets put towards more salvage and more printing. But also that's redistributed across queer led businesses and activisms on a monthly basis. I also print money, not in a legal way. I'm not a felon. Um, just in terms of like printing posters that people get in exchange for money that goes to fund different types of mutual aid, community projects or events. So here are some examples of um, posters I've made that have uh, generated funds for different causes. Uh, basically, I have learned from the mode of printing papal indulgences to fund the construction of churches and the waging of war in the 16th century, and I've adapted that um, economic model to my own legitimately heretical purposes. And so I create a micro-capitalist critical economy, a continuum of old paper and fresh prints advocating for liberation and the abolition of prisons and other forms of oppression. And that economy is nestled within one of the capital cities of capitalist violence. I'm, I'm speaking from London. Or as B. Oakley from Gender Fail Press describes their model, my work as Camp Books is not, not for profit, but it is profit for survival and profit to continue our work without other means of capital. And in terms of my printing, these posters and pamphlets contain rigorous, I hope, words about queer liberation drawn largely from or in conversation with historical source materials. And when someone orders them from me, I write them a letter, sending them good vibes. And I also have printed hundreds of stickers that say queer past nearest queer futures, which I give to everyone. Um, I've actually survived this pandemic in part by sending like 500 envelopes or more to both friends and for the most part strangers with little pamphlets and posters and books and messages hoping for their safety and telling them that it's going to be okay. I'm a printer pen pal, which feels good. It feels like maybe it's the most important work I can do as a historian because when I do it, I know I'm carrying forward a really common and consistent part of 20th century queer history. If you look at the earliest periodicals by homophile groups, they include information both about finding pen pals and information about how historically we're not alone as queer people. From one magazine in the 1950s to the Radical Fairy Digest beginning in the 70s. Um, it's also true that pen pal correspondences form the backbone of other queer activisms. For instance, um, they comprise a prison abolition archive all of the information about the insides of prisons and how horrific they are, how inhumane and also incapable of offering rehabilitation and healing comes from our queer incarcerated comrades that we're pen pals with. Um, and these are just a selection of, of some of the groups that do that kind of work. Um, and although it's one of the largest, probably most sprawling queer archives in existence, these organizations have existed for a long time and in every major city, try to find yours. Um, it's also most likely the largest queer archive never to be constituted outside of our imaginations. Not only because of the obstacles in bringing it together, but also because I don't even know if some of my letters to inmates have made it to them, let alone if they'll be saved. 
I begin with these particular archives, more recent assemblages to issue from queer activism, crucially because they are begun and shaped largely outside of institutions like universities. And because I believe that all assemblages of material, all archives are relational. So just as we cannot separate the colonial archive from the national archive, from the police archive, and that casts a shadow over how the majority of information is saved and stored and organized, even within special collections, these assemblages of materials made by people under duress and outside of those institutions, I think are starting to leave a counter stamp on our collections, an alternative path in terms of how we collect, how we conceive of and quantify and qualify their contents. And that's especially the case now that there's been, I think, significant uptake over the past few decades of rare archival materials from social justice movements, including queer archives inst into institutions. And this work I'm describing, the work of a queer historian and printer working between the outside and the inside of powerful institutions, it's, it's part of an even larger movement of ad, 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 advocacy, oh my gosh, advocacy, excuse me, for uh, advocacy for total liberation, uh, total liberation of LGBTQIA people as their identities intersect with classism, sexism, racism, ableism, you know, all forms of discrimination. Um, and those liberation movements have always had to publish and share their own histories in the face of harassment and with constant threats of destruction. I could never say that enough. Um, we've always had to make our own communication networks in order to tell each other what's happening and tell each other that it's going to be okay. So I work my way backward from where we are now to the moments of continuity in the past that I can find, flashes of kindred spirits. But I'm also precise about my place within this world of effort. It's not frontline work. Like I said, I use the word nourish because that word is about feeding and helping things grow. And I see the history of print as resources to help those at the front lines feel like they have op options to draw from or lineages to support them from burnout um, or that they have things worth reading that will force them to sit down and rest for a second. And I think the past is actually a really cheap and plentiful resource that we all deserve to be nourished by. So in honor of Enid Mark, uh, printer and artist and namesake of the lecture I'm delivering, I uh, want to dedicate this talk to all the queer printers and queer pen pals and historians and librarians and booksellers out there who are also working to nourish us. This is my pep talk to you. This is my use of the kitsch of history to give you a really big applause. Um, this talk is to offer you nourishment in turn by looking into something of the deeper history of the connection between your queerness and your chosen medium in books and prints. The history of your desires runs deep and the paper trail is long, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done to retrace our steps. So here are just a few of your ancestors. And relatedly, this talk is also something of a roadmap or um, to all of you who might want to print or publish your own words. Just copy what I'm doing. Um, anyone who might consider keeping their bills paid by selling books, both new and old, you know, it's a way to make a living. So this talk will first delve into the history of the word queer, um, kind of how it relates to my printing practice. And then secondly, we'll go into the queer labor that is book selling, focusing on 18th century examples. So archives are for divination. Here's how I see it. Um, think about the future you wanna see for yourself uh, or for those who come after you and go into the archives and write the history of how it came into fruition. It's just a simple truth that posters hang on walls and books flop on shelves and tables and that assembling these materials in certain ways does a lot to define spaces. Ideally spaces to come together if you have a bedroom, mark that space with posters that demand joyful liberation for your black trans comrades. If you're a book collector, rearrange and add to your bookshelves to tell the story of liberation from oppression. If you're a librarian or a teacher, ditto. Teach about the history of trade unionism, about the history of coalition building. Claim whatever spaces you can for these ideas, objects that tell the history of humanity that's not relying upon subjugation. Why not? What have you got to lose in imagining a much kinder world for yourself and others? 
But even this isn't a new idea, claiming spaces in this way. You know, I think of Tommaso Campanella's utopian text, The City of the Sun, which he wrote in 1602 while imprisoned for heresy. And in the city of the sun, all knowledge is written on the walls of the city itself, free and clear information for people who hold all property in common. I have a very clear idea of what knowledge I would write on the walls of my city of the sun. Some of the words are in slides in this presentation. I hope maybe you have a clear idea of what you would write on those walls too. Um, and, and that's why I use the word queer. So it's an odd word. It always means something formulated against the norm, counter to the way things are, odd, strange, is an off the beaten path, which after all is beaten, which is kind of harsh and no fun. It enters the English language via Scotland or Ireland, maybe before that Germany, it's always described as obscure, um, but it gets used in a way that means kind of crooked or bent. So nowadays, queer can be a large scale rebellion, but it's past as it survives in print and manuscript forms, it always feels like little micro dissensions, little pockets of resistance. And pretty early on, I feel like I'm always coming up across earlier examples. The word queer starts to get entangled with eccentric people, people who end up inhabiting their bodies in ways that are also odd, strange, against the grain, against the emerging norms of biology and biological sex that are being produced as disciplines within the science, the sciences. Um, so note that the Oxford English Dictionary doesn't connect queer with homosexuality until the 20th century. Um, but the examples I'm about to work with are from the 18th and queer floats pretty close to some pretty recognizable people where we're about to see. Um, so really more work deserves to be done about this. Um, if anything, you know, the Oxford English Dictionary is kind of just a, a launch pad, um, not really an end point. And if anything, I'd like to advocate in my limited time here for uh, a project that brings together this universe of words around queer to embellish its subversiveness. But all of this is to say queer ultimately describes how people leverage the heft of their very own bodies against vast forces that conspire against them. The law, heteropatriarchy, dehumanizing capitalist practices. You get the picture. You get the picture because we're living in the picture. The picture is actually a tableau and we're all in it right now. Um, but I think queer takes those long, sometimes invisible, deeply structural concepts and makes them legible on a person by person basis. It's swirled across our very bodies. And why do I focus on queer in print as print? Because to me, print processes are extensions of those bodies. Their documents are made accordingly to bodily motions and expressions. Printed books and posters and pamphlets, no matter what technologies are used to determine their shape, are still ultimately impressions made by bodies, muscles clenching, forced contortions that engage in a process that is ultimately repetitive and reproductive, but not necessarily procreative in the sense of in that sense of the word. I also focus um, on early uses of the word queer because they are obscure and vague and intuitive. The meaning is really hard to pin down, and it relies often on context clues provided instead by other more precise words that cluster around it. In this sense, I think the 18th century use of the word actually seems to hold a lot of potential uh, of its future use by um, Jose Esteban Munoz in his 21st century book, Cruising Utopia. And that's the text that's on the slide. Queer is not yet here. We're not yet queer. We have never been queer. Yet queerness exists for us as an ideality that can be distilled from the past and used to imagine a future. Queerness is a structuring and educating mode of desire that allows us to see and feel beyond the quagmire, the present. The here and now is a prison house. And that, really gets to what the stakes are of using queer in its more kind of ancient, obscure, but odd and strange and resistant sense. Um, and that's at first, the word queer exists beyond biological essentialism. It's not a medical word. Biological essentialism and its consequence, biological determinism is and has always been a tool of patriarchal and colonial oppression. People who dare call themselves feminists yet use this tool to exclude, for instance, trans people are working with really ancient tools of oppression and as a strategy that can never yield feminist liberation. So I use queer to resist and go beyond that. I think, you know, 
And this requires a dual process. You know, queer is a strategy, a method, but it can also apply to recovering certain subjects and the glorious lives they've led. And my cue here um, in talk talking about books as kind of bodily excretions and also talking about the gesture of creating books as being a way of embodying and getting to queer history, queering history even, comes from uh, Larry Mitchell's 1977 book, The Faggots and Their Friends Between Revolutions, self-published through his own Calamus Press, obviously named for the Calamus section of What Women's Leaves of Grass, um, he ran this plot press out of his Lavender Hill commune in upstate New York, part of which was funded through the commune's work at the local Moosewood Cafe. So there is another example of an alter alternate queer economy based on nourishment uh, of a more food-based kind. Um, so here's, the, here's what I'd like to read you. The faggots cultivate the most obscure and outrageous parts of the past. They cultivate those past events which the men did not want to happen and which once they did happen, they wanted to forget. These are the parts that faggots love the best. And they love them so much that they tell old stories over and over again, and then act them out. And then as the ultimate tribute, they allow their lives to recreate those obscure parts of the past. The pain of fallen women and the triumph of defeated women are constantly and lovingly made flesh again. The destruction of witty faggots and the militancy of beaten faggots is constantly and lovingly made flesh again. And so these parts of the past are never lost. They are imprinted in the bodies of the faggots where the men cannot go. I think of myself as undertaking this kind of embodiment with my prints and with my reading practices and with my queering of history. And also, um, in addition to the stakes of using the word queer, the failure of, I would say, for instance, hateful people, legislators, clergymen, and civilians alike, people who advocate for a model based on binary gender, is it's a failure um, to grasp the history of how gender and sex have been created, defined and redefined and policed as concepts. So regardless of all the work of institutional archives and libraries um, in miscataloging or destroying queer materials, gender and sex as we style them have incredible variance and elasticity over time and have always been moving targets. And that's where we come into play here as people interested in history and in books and in their making. As a historian, I see part of my role as highlighting this variance and contingency, having fun with it, making that fun clear and easily accessible. And given its blurry, mysterious origins, queer in and of itself signals this disruption to me. And it signals a disruptive temporality, one that collapses past and future in, I think, some pretty thrilling ways. Um, the fact that Munoz's definition of the year 2009 feels like a kind of accurate unpacking of its use in the 1590s and 1690s gives me whiplash and I like that. So what I will emphasize is this. Ultimately, over the 500 years of its history, the word queer is a meeting place for multiple, multiple meanings, or as some people prefer to call it now, an umbrella term for variances in sex, gender, and the spectrum of their relations to one another. Queer is a word that enacts intersectionality down to its roots. And I think that we have to be upfront about that, upfront about that etymology, so that when you dare to use the word, you agree to being intersectional too. For that reason, in this talk, I'm less interested in how it is an umbrella term for our very contemporary identities, LGBTQIA. Um, I'm also not much interested in the invention on heterosexuality and its consequences for pathologizing other forms of desire in the 19th century. Instead, I'm interested in this earlier iteration and how it is literally impossible to be categorized in our contemporary terms. How this simply resists through stubbornly maintaining a kind of mystery, which forces us to stick together, to come together. In that blurriness, there is real power to come together. And by 18th century standards, we all might be queer. So here's an example of what I mean by that. Uh, introducing a character, the queer old beau. I'm going to focus on the second stanza of this poem describing him at the bottom of the engraving, but I've copied out the whole thing. When air at court he shows his face, the breeding ladies quit the place, take him in short from top to toe and set him down, the queer old beau. That's published by Matthew Darley uh, in 1772. And the person thought to be depicted in this image is Samuel Drybutter. 
Now, Samuel Drybutter pictured here across several other prints from Matthew Darley's print shop over the course of the 1770s, where he is known as Ganymede, um, and also seen here flirting literally with the hangman, was according to the scholar Richter Norton, uh, both a jeweler and a bookseller who kept a shop in Westminster Hall. Richter Norton has tracked Drybutter in and out of the Old Bailey records for a number of cases revolving around stolen goods, jewelry and snuff, bo snuff boxes, never books, <laughs> uh, switching roles between defense and prosecution. So kind of a shady dealer. At the same time though, uh, Drybutter appears in the Old Bailey records throughout the 1770s for sodomy. So here's a quote from Richter Norton. Drybutter was in fact a notorious sodomite and was considered to be the leader of the Macaroni Club of the 1770s. He was first arrested for attempted sodomy on the 23rd of January, 1770, and he was committed to Todd Hill Field Bridewell. In September, 1770, he was again apprehended for soliciting a man in St. James Park. He was already so notorious at that point that the populace, especially the women, were so enraged against him that the guards were sent for to attend the coach and protect him from their fury. He seems to have propositioned people constantly throughout the 1770s, including his own serving boy, his serving boy's friends, uh, a horseman who was on active duty patrolling the horse guards and various soldiers in St. James Park. There are depictions of Samuel Drybotter arguing at a coffee house on behalf of others who had, been on, who had been on trial for sodomy and getting attacked by a mob for it. He was arrested almost yearly over the course of the decade for soliciting sex with other men, and he was severely beaten by the mobs that gather around him pretty much every time. Um, and every time he's described as a jeweler and a bookseller. In 1781, Drybutter was last depicted in London before he left uh, for France, where he eventually died in 1787, we think. But in 1781, this description from the complete modern sp London spy um, shows him d walking uh, along the street with another man. And it said, the, the, here's a quote from it. Do you observe that man who is now sauntering towards Covent Garden? He is one of those wretches, almost unknown in England. He subsists by gratifying the unnatural vices of his own sex. In short, he is the companion of an infamous fellow whose name is Dry Butter and who, though well known to be guilty of this horrible crime, has hitherto somehow evaded all attempts to bring him to punishment. As Richter, Marvel, uh, Richter Norton has marveled about this excerpt, it's hard to appreciate how this bookseller managed to live as pu a publicly known homosexual and to set society at defiance for such a long time. But clearly he was one of life's survivors despite being queer bashed and despite a long campaign of press vilification. Now what Norton is referring to in terms of press vilification um, is the wider context for, for these, these four illustrations that survive of dry butter. Um, what he's talking about is in large part due to Matthew Darley's printing shop, which was self-styled as the macaroni print shop. That dry butter was a queer old beau and a bookseller who is constantly portrayed in popular media as a sodomite links the word queer to same-sex attraction, and in turn, to a certain fashion sweeping the nation at the time. At least if mass-produced satirical prints, uh, newspaper items, and characters in short stories and plays are to judge. And th this subculture went by the name Macaroni. Macaronis wore expensive silk suits and tricorn hats. Yankee Doodle Dandy was a song sung by British soldiers to portray the rebelling colonists in North America as effeminate. These people were named macaroni after limp pasta that came from Italy. England wanted to blame continental travel and education for effeminacy and homoerotic desire rather than see it as homegrown. Now, macaronis as queer subjects are really important for what I mean when I say that gender and sex are moving targets and that prior to the language of LGBTQIA identities, we have common queer ancestors. Some macaronis are clearly messing with gender. They're cross-dressing, they're amplifying feminine qualities, they're wearing makeup, and they're working on a spectrum that is documented at times as drag and at times as trans feminine. And on the other hand, some macaronis are clearly wearing versions of these styles simply to signify that they don't want to bed women so much as other men. So like the first clones. They are also etymologically crucial for linking expressions of sex and gender with otherness, a language of foreignness that spreads beyond the continent and follows along lines of trade and imperial bloodshed, 
uh, a history of macaronis that has yet to be written. But for now, what we can say is that what Matthew and Mary Darley did as publisher and engraver husband and wife duo with their macaroni print shop was make a living off of satirizing these people while at the same time creating a sense that queer old bows were everywhere. <laughs> In this print, you get a sense of it. You see macaronis, known for their vanity um, and taking hours to get dressed every day, coming to visit their own caricatures, kind of cruise them, if you will. Um, and in the windows, you see a range of different prints. This art mimics life. The Darleys published over 100 variations of macaronis uh, in, throughout, their, throughout their prints um, in thousands of copies or more. So for instance, there are farmer macaronis and botanic macaronis. Um, the botanic macaroni there is Joseph Banks, who had just returned from colonial voyages. So again, a link between the macaroni and the other. Um, there's a, the local, my, one of my local neighbors, the Tower Macaroni. Uh, there are macaronis for each neighborhood of London, Southwark, Knightsbridge, Chelsea, Westminster, the city. There were macaroni depictions of every job baker, banker, soldier, priest, equestrian, Hibernian antique turned modern macaroni as pictured center here, and the macaroni auctioneer, of course. There were macaroni bricklayers, macaroni builders, waiters, and here Julius Sabis, a former Afro-Caribbean slave who became known for living a life to the fullest luxury in London he, he could once he was freed. Not pictured here uh, were also so-called oriental macaronis and macaronis from towns all over England, and onward to Scotland and Ireland. So queer old macaronis as a concept and as a printed body draw together all of the major features of early modern queer history. Um, they were subjects of moral panic and persecution, in particular by the Society for the Reformation of Manners, which was partially involved in creating the first police force in London, who in turn majorly persecuted them because it's way easier to persecute a queer than someone who's maybe an armed robber, for instance. Um, so the birth of blackmail and, and that type of, um, the type of, I guess, policing that followed gay men into well into the 20th century um, starts here in London. Um, and they also, this is also a collection that in its varied depictions um, is a kind of satirical precursor to later 19th century anthropologies of human subjects that sought to categorize and pathologize sexual and gender variants alongside of race. These prints start to do that work in their own way. And if you're looking for the earliest examples of mass produced depictions of queer culture that cut across class in English, here they are. But at the same time, as my friend E.J. Scott says, they're also the first stirrings of a, homo of a homophobic mass media. Some of these depictions are really sat satirical and offensive. And at the same time, many of them are depicting and queering fairly everyday people in fairly common professions. But there's also something else going on to revisit the macaroni print shop. And that's that Darley's depiction of these people um, shows them partaking in a good old bit of um, queer reclamation. Again, something that Jose Esteban Munoz might call a disidentification. It's about recycling and rethinking the encoded meaning of uh, these satires. There's a process of disidentification which scrambles and reconduct, uh, reconstructs the encoded message of a cultural text in a fashion that both exposes the message is universalizing and exclusionary machinations, but also recircuits its workings to empower minority identities and identifications. Where these portrayals seek to harm, they're also being used as a place to meet, to see, to be seen, to cruise, to even get fashion tips, to find out how to become a macaroni. And obviously it's this exact formation, a bunch of queers packed in together on a street um, that has historically been the hardest for police to break up and has created the scenes for our resistance and our rioting. And to continue to kind of crack this code of the macaroni print shop, this profusion of prints tells us a lot about what the community historian Alan Berube called queer work and its place within labor history. I have a long quote coming up, but let's do it together. He writes, in recent years, labor historians have been looking at how work has been gendered as women's work or men's work, how work has been racialized such as black work or white work, and how work has been ethnicized such as Irish work, Chinese work, etc. Since at least the 19th century, 
work has been increasingly homosexualized as queer work or heterosexualized as straight work or even anti-gay work, such as military service. Understanding queer work can help open up labor history to new areas of study. This concept can help us put the lives and struggles of queer workers into labor history, as well as those of heterosexual co-workers who stood with them as allies. And it can help us better understand how the growing homosexualization and heterosexualization of the workplace has affected all workers regardless of their sexuality. The first reference to queer work in the United States that I, as in Alan Garube, is aware of is a poem published in Vanity Fair in 1860 as a parody of Walt Whitman's Song of Myself. This poem makes fun of those white men who work as counter jumpers. That was slang for salesmen in dry goods and department stores who sold fabric to ladies, a word that later became one of the many derogatory terms for gay men. I'm a counter jumper, the parody begins, weak and effeminate. I love to loaf and lie about the dry goods. I loaf and invite the buyer. I am the essence of retail. I am the box of silks fresh from France. I am the creature of weak depravities. I am the counter jumper. I sound my feeble yelp over the wolves of the world. And Ruby goes on to say, by 1927, a Los Angeles psychiatrist wrote that the choice of occupation among homosexuals is, quote, to a considerable extent determined by their homosexuality. Thus, we find many engaged in dressmaking, millinery, beauty parlor work, crocheting, embroidery. Others work at window trimming or in drapery, picture and art shops. Still others are to be found among painters, sculptors, musicians, actors. Others again in the army, navy, police, and among prison guards, male nurses, masseurs, and public bath attendants. I want to incorporate the entirety of the macaroni prints of the 1770s and 80s to continue this study Berube initiated on queer labor. Look back to Samuel Drybutter, the queer old beau and bookseller, and the history of bookselling amongst all of those other professions that are portrayed as queer labor. Because Drybutter wasn't the only one to make a living in this way. And nowadays, queer book selling is huge. There are so many queers who have made a living selling books, not just antiquarians like myself and Gerard Koskovich, uh, and at an earlier date, Elsa Gidlow, but also in any bookshop. Um, Andre uh, Andrea Lawler, author of Paul Takes the Form of a Mortal Girl, talks about their own book selling alongside many others in this great 2019 Lit Hub article, where they say, many well-known writers have tarried in the fields of shelving. Writers like Justin Torres, Leah Lakshmi Piepsa, Samarash Sinha, Garth Grenwell, and C.A. Conrad, and the list goes on. So in honor of that queer labor, I'm going to end with a direct ancestor to my work with Camp Books, alongside a shout out and a thank you to my friend and colleague Heather O'Donnell of Honey and Wax Books, because when I first mentioned this 18th century bookseller to Heather, she went right out like any excellent, highly skilled bookseller can and found a broadsheet depicting them. So here we are. Um, and this allowed me to spend more time to enter in the world, uh, their world of 18th century gender bending antiquarian book selling um, and also feel less alone myself. So here's a printed sheet depicting Dr. John Deverdian, given as a gift to people who purchased the wonderful magazine in 1793. Here's a poem about him, once again, a bow is used to describe him. And please note that his dress style is entirely after macaroni fashions from the boots to the wig to the tricorn hat. And there's a part of the title page of the same book um, that this that this uh, print came with and that uh, Diverdian was talked about in. Um, and if you'll note on this title page, uh, we find queer again alongside miraculous, odd, strange, supernatural, whimsical, absurd, out of the way, and unaccountable. All words I would be proud to have associated with my queerness, by the way. Um, and here is his business card with a few other depictions of him from later dates. And what you will notice among these repeated images is that between the publications of the wonderful magazine in 1793 and of the wonderful museums beginning in 1802, Diverdian had died. And upon his death, it was revealed that he had been assigned female at birth. So just to go back again and reflect, this is the, this is the uh, poem describing him as an eccentric before that reveal has been made. As a remarkable walking bookseller, quack doctor, etc., hawking old books as Moses do old clothes. Stop gentle reader and behold a bow and boots searching for gold, a walking bookseller, an epicure, a teacher, doctor and connoisseur. 
Now, even though the, you will notice a change in pronouns from then after, the, eccent the eccentricity or queerness um, is also shifted from his interest in old books and old coins and being a quack doctor to the fact of his being able to pass mail for the majority of his life, certainly over the course of his three decades living in England. Um, there's still a huge amount, in spite of the pronoun shift and a couple of kind of witty quips, um, there's still a huge amount of affection in the portrayal of Diverdian in this, in this, um, in this book, in the pages of like what is essentially a cheap, sensational collection of information. So here's a snippet from the life, um, uh, a queer past that nourishes my work and my thoughts about our queer, miraculous, unaccountable futures. Um, I'm going to change the pronouns back to he for this excerpt because I feel like it. This extraordinary person has never been known to have appeared in any other but the male dress since his arrival in England, where he remained upwards of 30 years. And upon occasions, he would attend at court decked in very superb attire and was well remembered about the streets of London and particularly frequent in attending book auctions where that macaroni auctioneer is presumably. And he would be to a large amount, sometimes he would bid um, to the amount of a coach load. Here a singular figure made him the jest of the company. His general purchase at these sales was odd volumes, which he used to carry to other booksellers and endeavor to sell or exchange for other books. It goes on to talk about how Diverdian's gender bending was only discovered when he got sick with cancer and that for years, friends took care of him without divulging the secret and multiple collections were taken up for uh, both for the end of life care and also to pay for a funeral. So beneath the sensationalization and the satire is actually a story of friends caring for one another until death. And in memory of Diverdian, a long poem is included that in fact de-escalates the sensation and instead normalizes Diverdian's decision um, by mentioning other instances of cross-dressing in history and listing all the reasons why Diverdian might legitimately have trans the gender assigned at birth um, in order to tap into his talents as a linguist and his love of old books. But maybe most important for finding a pocket of joyful acceptance for queer people in history is the ending couplet of the poem. Nor man nor woman by attire is known. The proof of all will be the heart alone. Clothing doesn't have a gender and gender doesn't matter. It's about your heart. What's interesting is that this poem is written fairly early on, the 1803 edition, Diverdian had died in 1802. Um, and there's a much fuller description of Diverdian's life and friendship circle there, which gets pretty drastically shortened when it's republished by the end of the century. And the prose descriptions get a little bit more of meanness to them. But why am I ending with this? Um, I guess on one level, it's to say that book selling has always been kind of queer and kind of queer accepting. Um, but I'm also ending by whittling down another really vast, large topic, because I think it rests as an important example for us to consider um, how much there is we don't know about Diverdian's life and yet how much that mystery can become a rallying place for different types of queerness. Um, it's often the case that this kind of gender transgression in the past has gotten coded as lesbian. That was a precedent that was certainly started um, in the late 19th century, describing people like Joseph Lobdell, who lived as a man, yet was the first person to be named as a lesbian by mainstream newspapers in the USA. Um, but to me, it's clear that these people are more similar to trans men, transcestors as they are called, um, given that they chose to live and use male pronouns and take on a male per, per, um, profession. But I also don't think we can leave behind Diverdian's iconic styling in fashion that was largely quoted as homosexual, that is the macaroni fashion. Um, so since there are shadows of trans identity, lesbian and gay longings imposed upon this person, I think it is perfectly legitimate to honor each of these longings all at once, so long as we hold them all at once and settle upon no one of them. Because I think that would be way too imprecise. Instead, I think we have to say and simply agree that we have a common ancestor. And that because we have a common ancestor, we can both honor our differences um, and advocate for those differences together and use those moments of odd, strange, supernatural, miraculous queer people to give us a common purpose, not only in the histories we write, but in the politics that we form from them. The proof of all will be the heart alone. 
Dividing to conquer is nothing new as a strategy. We're pitted against one another all the time for jobs, for funding opportunities and grants. We're pitted against one another by algorithms based on psychological studies that say humans respond better to bad news and arguments on social media than good news. Um, just to name a few forces that shape the space in which I'm speaking tonight. Um, but that also influences the work of historians to an incredible degree because division is also a simple administrative fact of the fragments of history that survive, what we write history from. If an algorithm is defined at its heart as a set of rules that must be followed in order to calculate a result, like a search, then libraries and archives, which are organized according to rules in order to make their contents of able to yield results are among some of the earliest manifestations of algorithmic thinking at work. Um, the thinking at work behind cultural accretion and preservation. And like any good thing, there are limits and flaws and opportunities for abuse. One of them being that this process of creating libraries is hugely based on a top-down model from empires to subjects. And that too has implications for how we can talk about and link forms of gender nonconformity, its experience, its theorization by and through archival remnants, how we can find and encounter people in archives um, and be tempted to categorize them in very limited ways. Um, my thinking on this really comes from the scholar Lisa Lowe in her like, earth shattering, I would say, uh, 2015 book, The Intimacies of Four Continents. Now she talks about it in an imperialist sense, but I think it applies almost wholesale to what I'm saying about gender because they're intimately connected. So she writes, the organization of archives discourages links between settler colonialism in North America and the West Indies and the African slave trade or attention to the conjunction of the abolition of slavery and the importing of Chinese and South Asian indentured labor, or a correlation of the East Indies and China trades and the rise of bourgeois Europe. In order to nuance these connections and interdependencies, we have to read across separate repositories that are organized by office, task, and function, and by period and by area precisely implicating one set of preoccupations in and with another. In pursuing particular intimacies and contemporaneities that traverse distinct and separately studied areas, the practice of reading across archives unsettles the discreetly bounded objects, methods, and temporal frameworks that are canonized by national history invested in isolated origins and independent progressive development. I think that's really, have been brought to bear over how we can write queer history. And I think that if we look to the distant past for blurry moments of intersectional identities, we can start to get beyond those problems, those problems of isolation. Um, and this has deep implication for how we visualize historicide and reproduce notions of humanity across history. And person by person, I think this has really deadly consequences for the queer, for the gender nonconforming and how we portray them. If we're not able to make connections across identities and their struggles, in addition, building communities is going to be impossible. If we can't even think it on a page, how are we going to do it in person? And the truth is, it's not happening enough in person. And that fragmentation, the way that materials are distributed across libraries and archives, open stacks and special collections might be a practical architectural necess necessity. Yes, it's true it is, but it can't be allowed to continue to overdetermine our thinking in the ways that it has, in the ways that it has seeped down from documents to the language that we use, individual words and parts of speech. Um, but I think you can change that by a matter of method. The archives you read across and connect the language you use, the grammar with which you shape your inquiries. So that's why I say queer pasts nourish queer futures. Queer pasts can be made to nourish queer futures. Queer pasts might have nourished queer futures. Queer pasts will have nourished queer futures. Um, and I take these formulations from Lisa Lowe's thinking once again, who writes about the subjunctive case, the conditional temporality of what could have been symbolizes, she writes, aptly, the space of a different kind of thinking, the space of productive attention to the scene of loss, a thinking with twofold attention that seeks to encompass at once the positive objects and methods of history and social science, and the matters that are absent, that are entangled, that are made unavailable by its methods. A lot is lost, 
but we risk losing more by not looking at what still survives and not connecting it together in different ways, reassembling it, reassembling that kitsch. Attention to language matters and grasp of past tense is crucial knowledge. It's a crucial part of these formulations of different presence and different future possibilities. And so here I am trying to play my part in changing the mileage that we can get out of the past tense and trying to select carefully the subjects written about in the past tense to make sure that they're ripe for change into the future perfect. The place I will have loved to inhabit, a place where we pool our resources to take care of one another when we're sick, a place to care for old books that tell us something about where we've come from. And each queer archive across the fragmented remains of our work can tell a different part of that story. In the future, when we do not rely on the incarceration of bodies or the exploitation of their labor to form the base of our societies, queer past will have nourished queer futures because the work of bent bars and black and pink and other abolitionist groups will have been realized. Uh, in the future, when we have healthcare, queer past will have nourished queer futures because healthcare for all is what groups like ACT UP have been fighting for for decades. Um, in the future, when our parents and our families love us unconditionally for who we are, queer past will have nourished queer futures because that's all we've ever asked for when you get down to it. All we've asked is that proof of all can be our hearts alone. Um, so that is the formal <sighs> part of my talk. Um, uh, note that I will get out of this uh, shared screen. I think I'm back. Um, note that some of this thinking is actually a little bit of a whistle stop tour, shall we say, of a course that I'm teaching this summer uh, with Lon through London Rare Book School, um, the link to which I will post in the chat now. Um, so I'm happy to take questions, um, although keep in mind that uh, I'm not used to talking to groups of people because in London we've been quarantined since December. I'm used to more one-on-one -on -one things, so I'm not very good at Q&As at the moment, but I'll try my best. <laughs> Um, so thank you so much, Brooke, for this wonderful, wonderful talk um, that's just so filled with ideas. I was sort of madly taking notes um, as you were talking and also just enjoying it so much. Um, and uh, so we panelists can't see all of you, so we're just imagining your faces and, and your presence, um, but we would love to have you um, ask questions in the Q&A function. There are already a few folks who have done that um, and you're welcome to sort of um, uh, upvote certain things so we know that you are interested in those particular questions and we can ask them. Um, so I'm just gonna start in with some questions, Brooke, if you're ready for them. I'm ready. All right. But I'll do my best, but I'm not really very well socialized at the moment. <laughs> I think we can all relate to I that. Think we can, so, yeah. yeah, we can be queerly um, socialized. Yeah. Um, so first question, do you think queer book selling will also aid in accessibility? Um, this, in this person's own um, personal experience with queer studies, and even as someone who is queer, they've only encountered writings in an academic setting. Mm -hmm. And everything from the language to the literal accessibility can be difficult. Um, how can we find sustenance in our literary past when it can be difficult to attain? Yeah, thank you for that question. And I think, yeah, it's it's an we're at an interesting point where um, you know the there is a moment in contemporary queer history in the 70s and 80s when I think the academy starts employing or at least funding in some senses queer historians and by the 90s you have this sort of birth of queer theory the first time that's used in 1990 you know Judith Butler's work um, and as well as um, uh, the epistemology of the closet comes out in 1990. So it's like, there's this big theoretical moment. And you're right that the language of it can be really difficult, um, very inaccessible. Um, and there's also the added accessibility issue that only certain classes in certain universities will teach this material. 
So how do you get to it? I think luckily a lot has changed in terms of being able to add PDF to pretty much the end of any book you may want. Um, there are a lot of really amazing, uh, I would say uh, like queer pirates on the internet that have made that accessible. Um, but in, in terms of language, yeah, I think by trying to focus on archival materials and let those objects speak for themselves. I am trying to get out of a over theoretical language to a practice more rooted in stuff in materials. Um, it, it's interesting to me that, you know, on the one hand, um, within the homophile movement of the 1950s, um, and 1960s, and then the liberation-based movements after 1969. They're all pub they're all self-publishing. Um, they're all self-publishing their own histories. They don't have a lot to go on because major publishers aren't really um, putting a lot of time and money into publishing historical knowledge, and that's created the problem of you know small self-publishing endeavors. Those books or in small runs, they don't, they don't like exist anymore. Um, the work I try to do is to continue on that tradition because I see a lot of people willing to say print queer fiction, but there's not a lot of people, mainstream publishers willing to make cheap paperback accessible forms of history. Um, so it's, yeah, it's definitely a problem. Um, the, I guess, you know, it, it's hard, it's also hard to answer the question without just giving you a barrage of links. Um, if, but, I, but I would say if you go to my website, there's a lot, there's a lot of information on there. And I do cite all my sources. And there is like, I would say a very thriving, lovely community of people on Instagram and just around the web, who are really committed in uh, communal history projects. Another really good place to start is the historian Alan Berube's writings, who I mentioned in this talk, he considered himself is a community historian, a public historian. And he very much wrote with those audiences in mind. And he translated his knowledge and grasp of say, Marxist thought um, and the history of philosophy, you know, to, uh, to wide audi widespread audiences. So Alan Berube is a good person to look up as well. Um, oh, and, a, and a, a few books that I've like loved that have come out recently. If you wanna go further back into the past, um, I guess is Jen Mannion's Female Husbands. Um, it's, it's, it's published by Cambridge University Press, but they have a paperback edition that's not as expensive. Um, so that is like a, the short answer. If you feel comfortable reaching out to me personally, privately, um, please do. If you just Google my name, my contact details should come up and I'd be happy to talk with you more about how to make these things more accessible. Thank you so much, Brooke. Um, next question. In terms of queer intellectuals, do you have thoughts on Anne Lister um, based in Halifax, England, and especially the ways that she is portrayed in media now um, versus in her own time and in her, in her growing modern popularity? I love this question for me. Thank you. So the first thing I would like to say about Anne Lister is I think Anne Lister is an amazing uh, case study in, um, you know, the kind of work, or I guess maybe amazing rallying cry in the kind of work that needs to be done still to recover queer history. Um, I've, I've said this in other environments, you know, I think, <clears throat> but I'll say it here, you know, I think on the one hand, there's an incredible amount of loss that we have to confront when it comes to history. But on the other hand, that loss teaches us not to know how to recognize what survives and how to find it. Um, and a lot does survive. And Ann Lister's journals were discovered in the 1980s. And there are these amazing precedents in, of lesbian publishing in the 80s that are, you know, like historical romances, fiction that imagine a lesbian past to, you know, rural England. Um, there's this book of photography like called Stolen Glances where it's like lesbians dressed up like like little medieval pages and stuff and like doing their thing. It's like all of this creativity and fiction writing that was happening in the eighties in a sense made possible a generate, you know, a generation of scholars who could then look, go into the archives and find where these things existed. 
Um, so that's also what I meant by, I start by the present and I work my way back to try to find the past of what I'm thinking and talking about. And once you know that you can look for it, you'll find it in a lot of cases. Um, so that's thought one about Enlister. My second thought is there was a big controversy here, here in the UK. Um, the, the church where Anne had vows with Anne Walker, her life partner, um, where they kind of promised each other in a kind of what is sometimes considered a kind of like queer marriage ceremony. Um, the church has a blue plaque commemorating that. And it, it, the, the plaque started by saying, Ann Lister, gender nonconforming entrepreneur <laughs> came to this church. Um, and after some lobbying by activists, they changed it to lesbian, which I take issue with because for precisely the reason I talked about in terms of Diverdian, I think Ann Lister repeatedly talks um, in her journals, I, I know I'm using she, her pronouns, um, but you know, she repeatedly talks in her journals about identifying as male um, and also had male nicknames and names, you know, his name John, went by John often, Gentleman Jack, you know, as the, as the show is called. Um, and again, I think this is an incredibly productive blurriness that, uh, that, yeah, that is gender nonconforming and should allow different types of people who identify in different ways to come together and find a common ancestor. So I do take issue with trying to pinpoint Ann Lister as a lesbian when the word lesbian was not really used in that way at that time, nor did Ann Lister who knew a little bit of Greek and knew all about all of these things was very well educated, nor did Ann Lister go, reach for that language. So it's like about preserving the mystery and the expansiveness of the language of historical categories, I guess is what I'm advocating for. Not like seeking to put everyone and categorize everyone because that category categorizing impulse to me feels very, also very colonial, very, um, it comes from a very kind of like medical anthropological establishment that I don't wanna, I don't wanna work with. Thank you, Brooke. Um, we have another question. Can you expand on your ideas about the micro capitalist critical economy that you have created? Um, that phrase really st struck this person as an interesting idea. Hmm, thank you for that. Yes, thank you. Um, I would definitely, let me post the link in the chat for this, um, I quoted Gender Fail Press and they just hosted a, um, a printed matter a little like panel that really um, gels with, I mean, it, it happened like last week, so I didn't have a lot of time to absorb it, but a lot of it gelled with my thinking um, and is about kind of the economics. It's called toward a self-sustaining publishing model. Um, and that's where I got the quote for from Gender Fail. Let me just post that and then I will answer your question, I promise. Um, okay, there's that. So yeah, um, it's, it's hard to find a way to make a living these days. You know, there aren't really many jobs going. Uh, if I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm trained as a historian, which means there may be less jobs for me than for most people going. Uh, and I wanted to find a way to live. I, I thought, you know, if, if I'm going to have a precarious life, I might as well at least um, work with that precarity to try to make some, uh, you know, to make particular decisions about how I will experience that precarity that at least feel resistant to um, what's most harmful about capitalism. And, and so kind of the way, the way I've gone about it is, you know, I guess I, I, I had a lot of freelance work, um, but everything went into um, anything I've made for a while now, maybe since 2017 um, has gone into buying old books. Um, and then reselling them for a bit of a profit and then putting that money into printing, um, which actually has a really useful, when it comes to new books, newly printed books, the um, markup that booksellers who say run a bookshop can make on it are very little. So the costs are pretty high. I've worked at a bunch of bookshops. So this is like the bookshop knowledge I can give to you. Whereas when you work with used books, um, you can make a better profit. You can buy them for much cheaper and the value added that you give them through researching, cataloging, and then quoting those books to buyers, whether they're libraries and institutions like Smith College or, you know, collectors or people who just 
love history and want to own this particular book, mm-hmm. um, yeah, you can you can make a little bit more money that way. Um, with prints, it's the same. It's true. You know, you can make a run of fifty prints for like I don't know, maybe ten pounds. And um, if you charge fifteen pounds for each of them, you know, you've made. You just need to sell one to kind of make back your costs, and the rest of that money can go to whatever your cause is. So, say when I'm publishing a book, I often will make a poster to sell in order to um, cover the publication costs, the cost of paying the author, the cost of paying the artist, whatever kind of cost and expenses come up. So I really encourage you to consider how like you can develop an artistic practice around printing, publishing um, and selling used things, whether it's vintage clothing or vintage books, old books um, to make your living. Because the other thing about it is it's it's secondhand. So it's fairly environmentally friendly. And we need to be thinking as creatively as possible about making use of all of our secondhand goods because we really shouldn't be making new things. We have we have enough, <laughs> but we can't, I mean, I think we should, I do think we should make some new things, of course, but you know, we don't need all the plastic. We don't need millions of copies of Fifty Shades of Grey or millions of copies of world global bestsellers. Um, we don't need to think on that scale anymore because it's really environmentally harmful. Um, that's also, I guess what I mean by the word micro is I really delight in the, like hundreds or say thousands of people I can keep in touch with through my prints. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't care about influencer level millions because I think it's unsustainable and kind of ecologically no, not very sound. Um, but again, if you're interested in book selling and printing, again, I would say, please email me separately um, because I'm lonely and I would love to give you some practical advice to pursue your path. Thank you, Brooke. Um, We have a question um, from a student um, that I want to share with you. Um, She says, thanks for a great talk. I'd love to hear more about your work, like what an average day looks like um, and in what you do and and advice you have for people interested in similar areas. And this is, you know, sort of building on what you were just talking about. Mm, How honest can I be about this? Well, and I also see this as like very resistant. This Maybe this fits in with the last question is like, how can you be critical of capitalism? Well, if you need to take a nap midday, that's how you can be critical to capitalism. And you can really only do that when you're own, your, your own boss. Um, my day typically starts with waking up and having coffee uh, with my partner and just like staring out the window thinking about like, what am I gonna do today? Like, what am I going to think about today? What reading should I put in between my email times? Um, And then I walk my dog and think about what I want to write. (laughs) And then I come back from that that walk and I write it all down. And then I, um, I put off emails to as late as possible because they're very distracting. And I also have very strict limits on my phone. So... I don't let myself really go on any apps more for more like Instagram more than 15 minutes. I would say treat yourself to turning off all your notifications um, and whatever you're create whatever you'd like to create in the world. Um, do that like first thing, you know. Think about it and then you know spend some time thinking on it and then do it first thing. Um, I don't know. <laughs> that feels like a very personal question. Um, you know, we also prioritize eating in our household. Uh, we make lots of good food, so please remember to keep stay hydrated and eat well. Uh, <laughs> um, I, th- I oh one other thing I will say maybe about my work day is like I do think of my work as having seasons. So the season I'm currently in right now is one that is very much focused on giving lectures, so writing writing up my thoughts for the lectures I have agreed to give. I'm teaching, I'm, I'm working towards this course in the summer that I'm giving. So yeah, this is a very writing and reading heavy part of the year. It's where I kind of try to spend more time reading other people's thoughts to take a break from some of my own and, and writing notes about that, writing in discussion with my reading um, and then writing to like reading to teach. Whereas uh, the late summer and fall is more about a, um, write, you know, issuing book catalogs, uh, things like that, Um, working on on some new printing projects 
things like that. So yeah, the, the year is roughly split between book selling and then publishing and then reading and teaching and writing. I love the seasonality of your work and how you bring all of these things together. That's so interesting. Thank you for sharing. I think a lot of like lectures kind of happen this time of year. So it means that I'm like the thinker. <laughs> Even though this is the beauty of thought. <laughs> Um, well, here's here's another question to think on. Um, Hannah Friedman asks, um, I was really struck by the archive, archives are for divination image um, on one of your slides. Could you say a little more about what it would mean to engage the archives as a site of divination? Well, for starters, bibliomancy is, uh, the which is the art of divining the future from, from books, um, Books meaning meaning kind of scrolls because it goes back to um, ancient Rome, ancient Greece. You know, it's it's a very ancient art of kind of picking up a book and alighting. You know, putting your finger on the page in order to tell your future. Um, that so that is a classic form of of divination. Um, and I think that when I was an undergraduate, I used to do that in the library. Uh, the open stacks of the library um, where I was, I would just kind of go and find a book and then sit down and read it and see like what, Billy like what, 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 what did I learn? What did it tell me? Um, I found a lot of strange, found a lot of strange things that way. Um, and I think what I realize, have realized over time is there's such an element of that when you go into an archive or a special collection. Um, you might think you know what you're looking for but often what you need to know is something that is just adjacent to it or something that you're turned on to because a librarian or someone else hears what your project is and happens to know the answer to it. Or in some ways, um, if they don't know that answer is withheld from you and your project is shaped in a new way. Um, so there are all these forms of um, mediation happening when you're at work in any kind of uh, from, from you know, something as granular to like the text itself to the space of the library or the space of the archive, depending on where that archive is. There are just so many mediating forces. And if you combine that with a kind of awareness that all of these other mediating forces led to that, that piece of information coming to you in the first place, you know, it had to survive, it had to be written, it had to be edited, it had to be published, all of these incredibly um, collaborative acts of textual production had to happen for it to be created and then for it to survive, for it to be cataloged, for it to be made accessible. You know, there's just this endless multiplication of forces at work. Um, and when I describe it to myself in those terms, it seems kind of magical. It seems kind of divinatory. Um, and when people present history to me as, as being fixed, um, I know that they're lying <laughs> because I know that there's so much chance involved. So I just feel like why not celebrate and kind of elevate that sense of chance involved in what you can access from the past, you know? Um, and I guess also that speaks a little bit to my spiritual practice. You know, I'm, I'm a practicing pagan. So of course I'm gonna, of course I put a lot of stock into divination. It's one of the oldest forms of knowledge making that known to humanity. Thank you, Brooke. Um, next question from Elise Watson. Do you think that there is more that archives and libraries as institutions can do to work against their own historical role in this material fragmentation and facilitate the kinds of connections you're talking about? Or are they doomed to separate? Um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, that was itself unbelievably nourishing and life-giving for this queer and for some great reading recommendations. Oh, thank you. Um, I think that, you know, we, we at least should try. <laughs> um, I think that, what do I think? I think that, uh, like I said, a lot has changed in terms of what libraries and institutions are starting to collect. And I mean, I saw just yesterday, so, um, a librarian at the Library of Congress posted a picture 
uh, holding up a new collection policy related to LGBTQIA accessions and acquisitions for, um, you know, for their collections. And so, it, so institutions are doing this anyway, or either way. And I do think a lot remains in those spaces to be recovered. Um, something that comes up that has come up um, in the National Archives here in London for all its problems is, um, you know, they're trying to recover these moments of queerness as they exist in their records. And it, and a lot, and, and you know, what it comes down to is a lot survives that has been miscatalogued or that has been silently looked at, you know, passed over. So whatever archivist or custodian in the past, they didn't feel comfortable destroying it, but they didn't want to make that knowledge easily accessible probably for reasons related to moral judgment being made upon the object itself. So I think we have to at least try to recover what we can. It's just about being realistic that the, we, it's about being re realistic about what the, what the obstacles are. You know, it's, you, you can like for warned as for armed, you know, if you know that this sense of fragmentation, that everything is a fragment on some level, um, if you know that, I think you deal with these historical materials with a different sense of a different sensitivity. And I think that teaching that sensitivity is important. So yeah, we gotta, we gotta try. I, and I, and I think that there are some really amazing people who are working in the, you know, in the field of archives and special collections who are doing that work um, of making things accessible to new generations of people who have new concerns. I only hope it continues. I only hope more jobs are made that allow people to do that. It's part of the process, I guess, you know, there's work that needs to be done outside of institutions. And then there are ways in which institutions can and are learning from that activism, those small, you know, historical societies and community queer collections, you know, a lot of the history of queer history is largely made um, by places like the GLBT Historical Society in San Francisco and the William Way Center and archives in Philly and the, the center in New York, you know, they have archives and ha have always um, cared about history in their own right for their own sake. Um, and I think, yeah, related to queer archives, larger institutions can take their cue from that work that exists that's already been done in terms of being sensitive to it and learning about how to make it accessible. Thanks, Brooke. Um, Finch Collins asks, can you speak to digitization as it relates to telling queer histories across archives and to discovery of such materials? As an undergrad, I found digital materials essential to my queer history projects. For example, the online Old Bailey records, but also crave the physical materials. Oh, Finch, you are a person after my own heart. I know what you mean. I have always felt like the digital has, has been complementary to um, the physical. Um, and yeah, I think it's important to say both exist can exist together, but what, you know, the digital cannot be a license to destroy physical spaces. And I think that's something that we're really dealing with a lot today. I know in London, you know, a lot of, a lot of queer spaces have closed and um, are having trouble um, with this idea that having apps or having, you know, digital access is what is what's closing them. And, and that's not true. Um, you know, we'll always want physical spaces, I guess. Um, I think the, you know, in an ideal world, this talk would be in person and the examples I would have used in it would have come from me spending a few days in Smith's library and archives. Um, but I had to rely on some of the digital resources that I had or knew about. Um, and yeah, I think it's, it's, it's my hope um, that we, I think there's been a lot of excitement about the digital humanities and digital possibilities. Um, and, you know, what I fought from the very beginning, cause I kind of, you know, I'm like, had the internet as a teenager, you know, I'm, I'm, have been digitally literate for a while. Um, but I, I've always seen it as complementary, not supplementary. If that, I think that's the right use of the word, you know, like you, one doesn't replace the other. It only points in the direction of where you could be going in person. Um, and I think it's really important for administrators and people who have 
um, say in how funding for research, for instance, is given out that like we still need to earmark money so people can do this kind of stuff in person, you know, and like prioritize it. <laughs> you know, those uh, there's only so so much that the digital can achieve, and a lot is lost. Thanks, Brooke. Um, one more question that um, uh, that we have time for. So Heather O'Donnell notes um, that she's thinking through the example of Deverian and the impulse to name and fix that identity as lesbian, trans man, macaroni, um, making her think about the role that descriptive bibliography um, often plays in fixing complicated books. Um, if something in a book structure is mysterious, the temptation for many of us to fall back on format or anatomy to find what you expect to see and assume what you know is missing. Um, but that simplifying, categorizing imperative can blind us to the events and forces that create the print object, um, which is often different. So I wonder if you can speak to that a little bit, just in this you know, very small concept in this last I, I, have. I love, yeah, I'm glad you read that because I think it's very, a very eloquent and useful and productive question. Um, also, hello, Heather. I am happy. Thank you for being here. It means a lot to me. I didn't know that would be the case when I gave my shout out to you. <laughs> but yes, it's good to see you. I miss you. Um, I think you know, I mean, de descriptive bibliography is such a different is such a difficult one because it's sort of, you know, in theory, it's taught us this movable skill set that can be applied to a lot of different things. And in practice, when it's taught, it's not applied to very many different things. And then this is the problem that arises that there are all these limit cases that kind of make it seem less effective. And I think if descriptive bibliography were taught with subjects like books, uh, prints depicting Diverdian, we'd be able to have way more um, thrilling discussions about what it means to be human beings engaging with and enervating and allowing for the survival of these texts to begin with. You know, it, it begins and ends with human hands handling these things and to try to describe them in a way that cuts out that human interference in all of its complexity is hugely dangerous. It's a little bit fetishistic. It's a little bit, um, you know, lacking, it lacks humanity, it, it gets dry. And I think, you know, we, I, I would hope that we would be able to move beyond that um, with renewed interest in the human lives um, behind the books and things that we love. So I'm always advocating for um, a, a model of book history and a model of bibliography that that um, considers first and foremost the flesh and blood behind those objects, no matter how irrecoverable that flesh and blood may seem. I think that's I think that's maybe you know it, it's the hardest thing to do. Um, everyone wants to quote Milton and say books are not absolutely dead things because it's easier to think that about books, but the truth is they are dead and living people are what are dealing with them and marking with them. And to recover those living people and get a sense of their humanity is really difficult work. Um, and I think that's the work we should be doing. Um, and I think that's the work that in its best moments, descriptive bibliography allows us to do better. But you're right, you know, like, let's teach a course of descriptive bibliography with, you know, only these types of books and, and see how problems of um, authorship and distribution, um, you know, how they, how they uh, play out. Let's do it, Heather. <laughs> Team teaching 2022. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brooke. Um, this has been such a wonderful conversation. Um, thank you for sharing your time and ideas with all of us. Um, in addition to Heather being present, Andrea Lawler was also present and was able what? to, um, yeah, and and said made a note in the in the Q and A um, to thank you for the chat the shout out. So I think there's um, community oh, wow. across this. Um, <laughs> 
this um, this Zoom um, that you might not even know is here. And we'll certainly share all of the comments um, that we didn't get to with, with you as well. But I wanna thank everyone for joining us. And um, thank you so much, Brooke, for, um, for bringing these ideas um, today and sharing them with us. So thank you all and um, have a wonderful day. Oh, thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Be safe.